Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're talking about how the engines and power units in Formula 1 are going to be changing for the next generation of cars. Now if you've already seen my video on how the current engines work, well the basic architecture is very similar. It's still a 1.6 liter V6 turbocharged engine. However, in the future it's going to be making significantly less power. So the really big change coming to the engines is how the fuel flow is going to be limited. So it's going to go from a mass flow limit to an energy flow limit. So currently the engines are limited to a fuel flow rate of 100 kilograms per hour. That's going to switch in the 26th season to 3000 megajoules per hour. Now these are difficult numbers to compare, right? They're different units. So it's like, well, what does this all mean? Well, let's translate this into a maximum theoretical power, assuming you had 100% thermal efficiency. Well, a fuel flow rate, we calculated in our previous video of 100 kilograms per hour, gives you a maximum power of about 1240 kilowatts. 3000 megajoules per hour, that's about 833 kilowatt hours per hour. In other words, 833 kilowatts. So you can see that number is significantly less and because we're operating at let's say about 50% thermal efficiency for these engines and then we switch over into units of horsepower because some people like units of horsepower, we have about 830 horsepower in the current generation engines versus about 560 horsepower uh, in the next generation of engines, all a result of that limited energy flow. Now we're also going to have less fuel. So currently they have about 100 to 110 kilograms of fuel that they can store. And in the future cars, that's going to be about 70 to 80 kilograms of fuel that they can store. Now there's some really interesting differences with how the fuel is regulated currently versus how those rules are going to change. So for example, currently there is no octane number maximum for the fuel. So in theory, your fuel flow is limited to 100 kilograms per hour, but if you were to have a higher octane fuel, then you could make more power using that same fuel flow. Additionally, there isn't anything exactly specific saying, hey, your energy density must be this. So if you have a higher energy density fuel, well again, that means you're injecting more energy with your fuel flow limit and thus can make more power. So both of these are levers that you can play with. Yes, fuel is very tightly controlled, so it's not a huge lever, but it is a lever that you can lean on a little bit to get a little bit more extra performance out of your vehicle. Well, that kind of goes away because now for 26, there is a limit on the octane number, a maximum which cannot exceed 102 research octane number and also because you have this energy flow limit say you have a more energy dense fuel well great maybe you save a little bit of weight but that doesn't mean your engine can make more power because again you're limited in energy flow not mass flow for your engine. Now a few additional points about the fuel that are very interesting. Currently, there is a minimum amount of oxygen by mass that you must have in the fuel of 3.45%. Now why is that interesting? Well, gasoline by itself does not have oxygen in it, so you have to have something added to it. For example, ethanol. So ethanol, you can see the chemical equation, there is oxygen in it, and oxygen by mass is about 35% of the weight of ethanol. So if you need about 3.5%, this is 35% by mass, well you need about 10% ethanol, meaning about E10, that would be a uh, valid fuel to use in Formula One currently. Now that is changing to a range from 3.45 as a minimum to 6.7 to 7.1 percent by mass. So we're looking at something like an E20 for the fuels for 26 and beyond. And in addition, these fuels are going to be sustainable, meaning not coming from crude oil, you know, developed from underground. So part of this is like this is this marketing thing, right? So if you think about the pyramid of like where do the emissions related to Formula One come from, the top of the pyramid would be the cars going around the track. You know, it's really not that much. Uh, another layer down in that pyramid, you have all the teams flying all over the world in order to make this event happen, right? And then there's all of us if we actually attend these events. You fly, you know, to Miami or Austin, 440,000 people going to Austin for the weekend, many driving, many flying in. That's an insane amount of emissions, you know, to get everyone to go to that event and view it. So that's kind of the pyramid there. Uh, and, and when we talk about sustainable fuels, it's like, okay, neat. Like, it's cool to develop that as an idea, uh, but it's not really making a huge impact in terms of overall emissions of Formula One.
Now, one last point on that fuel flow rate. So looking at a graph of fuel flow versus RPM, just like the current season, the next generation of cars is also going to have a very similar curve. It's gonna basically look identical. Different equation, but the overall goal is the same in that at lower RPM, you are limited in how much fuel you can use, reaching a maximum at 10,500 RPM. So that's about where you're gonna hit peak power because yes, you can go beyond 10,500 RPM, you can get more air, but you can't get more fuel. So you really can't make more power much beyond that. So very similar between current engine and the next generation as far as this plot. Now the other really big change coming to this power unit relates to the electric motor. So here we have a simple diagram looking at where we are today versus where we're going. So anything in blue is 26 and beyond versus everything in red here is the current generation of cars and then anything in purple is shared between them. So the thing is, yes, they both have an MGUK which is essentially the electric motor that can help power the car and propel it forward. It's attached to the crankshaft so it can send that power directly to the wheels. For the next gen car, this is making significantly more power, 350 kilowatts versus 100 20 kilowatts, so a much larger motor, 470 horsepower versus 160. So although the combustion engine is making much less power, the car overall is going to be making very similar power at about 1,000 horsepower. Some other big changes here looking at it, the energy that you can regen, so as you're slowing down, using that MGUK to put energy from the electric motor into the battery increases from two megajoules per lap to nine megajoules per lap. So a lot more energy, 2.5 kilowatt hours per lap that you can put back into that battery. However, you no longer have the MGUH. So the electric motor that was once attached to the turbocharger, which you could use to take energy, wasted energy that's going out the exhaust and turn it into useful energy that you could then store in the battery or send to the MGUK and help propel the car, that is no longer there. So one of the really interesting things about this is Mercedes has previously said the reason why they were able to achieve 50% thermal efficiency with their Formula One combustion engine they would not be able to do it. They wouldn't be able to hit 50% without the MGUH. So it'll be really interesting to see what that efficiency number is for the future generation of cars. And also because they no longer have this electric motor attached to the turbocharger, that means the return of turbo lag. So turbo lag will now be a thing again. I don't think it's gonna be that big of an issue because you have this huge you know, electric motor which is gonna provide you all kinds of torque at low speeds. So I don't think it's gonna be this you know, huge thing as far as a driving concern, but it is a variable that's going to come back into play. Now there's one rule that's very interesting to me that they did not change. So yes, they're going to allow for more regen and yes, they're going to have a significantly more powerful electric motor. However, the available capacity of the battery is not going to change. It's going to remain at four megajoules, meaning the maximum state of charge and the minimum state of charge that you ever have within the race, that range cannot be greater than four megajoules, which is about 1.11 kilowatt hours. So that means at any given moment, you can never use in a row all at once more than 1.11 kilowatt hours. So that brings up an interesting point because, okay, if you have a small electric motor that doesn't make all that much power, 120 kilowatts, how long can that run flat out before you use up 1.11 kilowatt hours? Well, that number ends up being about 33.3 seconds. So you can run that flat out for 33 seconds. Well, that's a really long time. So it doesn't seem feasible that within a lap, there's gonna be one moment in time where you run flat out for 33 seconds. But what is that now for the new motor? 350 kilowatts uses up 1.11 kilowatt hours very quickly in just 11.4 seconds. So what's the longest straight in Formula One? Well, I went back and looked at Leclerc's qualifying lap for 2022 in Baku, and there were about 22 seconds that he was accelerating on that long straight. And so if you look at these numbers here, well, it's apparent that, hey, you can actually run out of energy from your battery uh, before you get to the end of that straight. So vehicles could potentially be power limited on these long straights with the following generation of cars.
Now another really interesting point regarding that power limitation on long straights for the next generation of cars, well you're actually going to reduce the amount of power you can use as you get to higher speeds. So below 300 kilometers per hour you can use up to 350 kilowatts. Then you have a linear drop as you go from 300 to 340 kilometers per hour from 350 watts to now a maximum of 150 kilowatts. So this number could be longer uh, that you can actually run flat out because you drop the overall limit of power for that motor as you get to higher speeds. So if you're coasting, you know, 350 kilometers per hour, well, you can only use 150 kilowatts. So, you know, you have a bit more time that you can use it. But again, you know, it's, it's rare you get to speeds above this. And because they're going to have less power, that means it's going to even be more challenging to reach these speeds assuming similar aero. Now I should probably end the video here, but I'm not going to because there's something very perplexing about Formula One engines, and that's that they run gasoline, but they also run very lean. And usually those two things do not happen together. Gasoline engines don't really like to run lean, especially when you're trying to make a lot of power. And so there's two rules that come with the new regulations that are very interesting to look at. One of those being the minimum intake air temperature cannot be less than 10 degrees above ambient. So it has to be at least 10 degrees above ambient. Now you've got a turbocharger packing a bunch of boost in, you're gonna be compressing that air. Yes, it's gonna run through an intercooler, but chances are, you know, that's pretty tough to do to get it to just be 10 degrees warmer than ambient. The other interesting rule is that the intake pressure cannot exceed an absolute manifold pressure of 4.8 bar. That's about 70 PSI or about 55 PSI of boost, which is very high. That's a lot of air. And so when I heard these two numbers in the rules, it's very interesting to me because it's like, okay, well, if I know how much air they can put into the car and I know how much fuel they can put into the car, well, then I can calculate a theoretical limit on what the engine is limited at as far as the air fuel ratio. How lean can this engine actually run? Uh, what's the limit that Formula One says you may not exceed this? Now this gets a little tricky, right? Because we're given a number of energy per hour, not mass per hour. So it's not easy to do an air fuel ratio. Calculating the airflow at 10,500 RPM, that's very easy to do. We did it in the last video on Formula One. Uh, and so in the example here, we're going to be at 2,000 822 kilograms per hour. That's imagining we're at sea level, the ambient temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, and thus our intake temperature is 15 plus 10, so 25 degrees Celsius, and we get some air density numbers uh, going into that vehicle. All right, we've got half our equation solved. We just want to divide airflow by fuel flow to get our air fuel ratio. We know our airflow, what is our fuel flow? Well, we don't know what the fuel is, right? So we cannot say definitively. But we do know, you know, looking at the rules for what the fuel must be, that E20 could work as a fuel. So for the purposes of this, we're gonna use E20, 20% uh, ethanol, 80% gasoline. Now, we're just gonna say that's what it is. It's gonna be this weird synthetic blend that they create that is sustainable. Uh, but we're going to go with E20 here. Now if you do the math on E20 and this is your energy flow rate, well then that will translate to a mass flow rate of 74.5 kilograms per hour. So we take 2,822, divide that by 75.4 and that gives us an air fuel ratio of 37.9 to 1. That is very high. Remember, stoichiometric for a gasoline engine is about 14.7 to 1. For E20, that stoichiometric ideal ratio is 13.5 to 1. So if we take 37.9, we divide it by 13.5, that gives us a lambda of 2.8. So meaning 2.8 times the ideal air fuel ratio, a ton of air, very, very, very lean. I really doubt the engines will be running at this lean of a ratio. Now it's worth pointing out this 2.8 number is sensitive to temperature. So it is probably rare that you're gonna see, you know, at sea level, 15 degrees C ambient temps and your intake temps only 10 degrees higher than that. So if you were to have, for example, something like 70 degrees C intake air temperatures, well then that 
2.8 becomes 2.4. Uh, so that number can go down. Regardless, it seems extraordinarily lean and it doesn't seem to be a limit that will actually affect teams as far as, hey, are they going to be hitting that up against that and saying, oh, I wish we could go leaner than that. So that to me is really interesting. Like it's like to me, why is this a rule? Why is there a maximum intake pressure limit of 4.8 bar? Why do we also have an airflow limit on top of a fuel flow limit? Because it seems like our real limiting factor here is our energy flow limit for our fuel. However, this is introduced, right? And previously there was not this airflow limit, whereas now it is there. And I don't know why that's there, right? I don't know what advantage you may be able to have by running more air through the engine or why this rule exists. So I find that really intriguing. It's like, why is it there? And I'm not saying it shouldn't exist. I just don't know why it does, which is a terrible conclusion, right? Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.